Hello and welcome to, uh, to, I think this is part five, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I've been, uh, I, I don't know, I, I keep on getting sidetracked, but anyway, this is, I believe, part five of Oh That Mo, and uh, it's copied off of the computer screen. So if it's not good quality, I'm providing the link to the original. That you can click on that and go to that. Uh, and where you can see the Hadith and the Quran that they're presenting to uh, back up their claim that Mo was quite a character, if you know what I mean. So I will begin it now. Prediction appears when you compare, Go back a little uh, bit. for example, a handful of verses in the Quran. Just, but even if you point it out, uh, they say, ah, it's no big deal. Uh, but I look at it and say, maybe there's something wrong here. According to Islam, the Quran is infallible. That is, it is free from error. Moreover, Islam teaches Muhammad's Sunnah that is, his sayings and deeds in the Hadith literature, are to be followed by Muslims. This presupposes they are accurate and thus worthy to be followed. For example, Muhammad said, Keep to my Sunnah. And there are many references in the Quran ordering Muslims to obey and emulate Muhammad's teaching and example. Thus, if there are historical, scientific, logical, and prophetic errors in the Quran and authentic Hadith material, this proves Muhammad was a false prophet, and that Islam is false. The Quran is chock full of errors, whether logical or historical, scientific, mathematical. You name the category, the Quran probably has an error that would fit into it. An example of a logical contradiction appears when you compare, uh, for example, a handful of verses in the Quran, such as Surah 2, verse 221, where we are told that Muslims cannot marry idolaters and unbelievers. If we compare that to Surah 5.5, where we're told that Muslim men can marry Christian women, we may infer from that that Christian women are not idolaters and unbelievers. That is, if Muslims cannot marry idolaters, and they can marry Christians, then Christians, as a matter of deductive certainty, can't be idolaters. However, according to Surah 9, verses 28 through 33, Christians are idolaters and unbelievers, so the Quran contradicts itself. Muhammad believed the reason the sun appears to move in the sky is because of the sun's movement and not the earth's rotation. In Quran 36, 38 we read, And the sun runs his course for a period determined for him. That is the decree of him, the exalted in might, the all-knowing." In the Hadith literature, Muhammad explains this verse, leaving no doubt this is what he believed. In Sahih Bukhari, we read, Narrated Abu Dar, The Prophet asked me at sunset, Do you know where the sun goes at the time of sunset? I replied, Allah and his apostle know better. He said, It goes, i.e. travels, till it prostrates itself underneath the throne, and takes the permission to rise again. And it is permitted, and then a time will come when it will be about to prostrate itself, but its prostration will not be accepted, and it will ask permission to go on its course, but will not be permitted. But it will be ordered to return whence it has come, and so it will rise in the west. And that is the interpretation of the statement of Allah, and the sun runs its fixed course for a term decreed. Hence it is clear Muhammad believed the reason it looks like the sun is moving in the sky is because of its movement and not the earth's rotation around the sun as science proves. This is a clear scientific error in the Quran and Ahadith. As the following modern science book confirms, the real reason behind the apparent motion of the sun through the daytime sky is the rotation of the earth. The earth orbits the sun, unquote. One of the most popular Muslim arguments is the scientific accuracy of the Quran. The claim here is that Muhammad uh, revealed things that couldn't have been known during his time. And this was just nonsense. The Quran is a scientific catastrophe. Chapter 1886 of the Quran 
uh, says that the sun sets in a muddy pool. Uh, 86, 6 through 7 say that uh, semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs. 88, 20 says that the earth is flat. Uh, 65, 12 says that there are seven earths. Um, 2265 says that the, the sky would fall on the earth if Allah didn't hold it up. Um, 37, 6 through 10 and 67, 5 declare that stars are missiles that God uses to shoot demons who try to sneak into heaven. And, you know, Muslims look at all of this and then they tell us that uh, the Quran... Oh, I gotta tell you something here. Um, not only is the sun, uh, not, not only is the earth flat in Islam, you know, spread out like a carpet, you find it, I find out in El Tabari Hadith that the earth is actually spread out on the back of a giant fish called Nun. Well, actually, I think uh, Nun is the name of uh, the Arabic name for fish. I think it's called Behemoth and other things that's called in Tabari. But the, according to Muhammad, the earth is spread out on the back of a giant fish. And uh, it's agitated, so it would cause earthquakes it, with, with its agitation. But it says that Muhammad, that Allah uh, cast down mountains as pegs, stabilizers, to keep down the earthquake so the earth wasn't, isn't destroyed. So when you read the Quran about... Uh, how mountains are to stabilize earth to keep down the earth to stop the earthquakes you find out in El Tabari that Muhammad believed that the earthquakes were not caused by geological forces but caused by a giant fish that the earth is spread out on. He also believed that seven other earths are spread out on that same fish too so yeah I'll continue here. Is known to be true because of the scientific miracles in it and I just, I just want to know what did Muhammad say um, that, you know, that, that an average person walking around wouldn't have known. Everything else beyond that, he got wrong. He got everything that he could possibly get wrong, he got wrong. Muhammad taught Alexander the Great was a righteous Muslim who believed in and obeyed Allah. In Surah 18 of the Quran, Dul Qurnayn, which means two horns, is said to be a man who had Allah's support was holy and righteous, and believed in, and worked with, and obeyed Allah. There is much evidence the author of the Quran viewed this dual Quran as Alexander the Great. First, many of Islam's greatest commentators of the Quran affirm these verses are about Alexander the Great. Second, on ancient coins there are drawings of Alexander the Great with two horns on his head, which is significant since again, dual Quran means two horns. Third, Arabs like Al-Asha, who was a poet living shortly prior to Muhammad, and Hassan ibn Thabit, who was contemporary with Muhammad, called Alexander the Great dual Quran. Thus, the expert on Alexander the Great, Richard Stoneman, affirms, quote, The two names, Alexander the Great and dual Quran, were already synonymous when Muhammad came to compose this surah of the Quran. In fact, modern scholars have shown the Quranic story of this dual Quran in Surah 18 actually comes from the pre-Islamic mythical Syriac source called A Christian Legend Concerning Alexander, translated into English by Sir Ernest Alfred Wallace Budge in 1889. When one compares the Quranic story in Surah 18 to the Syriac tale of Alexander the Great side by side, there is no question this is where the Quran got the Alexander fable. There are more than 11 similar features between the two stories, such as Alexander having two horns, being given power, the sun rising on the people with no cover, punishment of the unrighteous, Gog and Magog spoiling the land, and the building of a wall as a defense. As Stoneman notes, quote, The commentators on the Quran universally assume that dual Quran here in Surah 18 is the name of Alexander. Their assumption was clearly correct, since the two stories here in Surah 18 associated with dual Quran are precisely those two stories associated with Alexander in the Syriac legend of Alexander, current shortly before the composition of the Quran. This proves unequivocally the Quran is not of divine origin, but instead stole earlier uninspired mythical stories or legends. Moreover, Surah 18 also proves the Quran is historically inaccurate for claiming Alexander the Great was a righteous man who believed in and obeyed Allah. 
4. The historical evidence concerning Alexander the Great shows he was actually an unrighteous polytheistic pagan. Oh, one more thing about uh, Alexander the Great. In uh, the Quran, talks about this Dukarnain building a wall, a wall to keep out Gog and Magog from bothering these people that are so stupid they can't understand language. Uh, builds this huge wall between two mountains, and it's made out of iron. Uh, well, it's made out. Of, it's, it depends on which Quran version you're reading, either lead or copper. But it's it's he used billows to create it, to melt it to you know make it really so they couldn't go through it nor over it that's how big it was and guess what it's supposed to be there until judgment day and nowhere on this planet have we found a huge metallic wall to keep out Gog and Magog so anyway uh, if you uh, if you're Muslim you have a comment put it here and we'll see if, if you feel that oh I'm, I'm this they're reading into things they're taking things out of context here then put it in comment here and we'll study it okay bye